If you want to start, I mean, just tell us a little bit about your work at Riverside. Radiation Oncology Department. I see patients uh, once they've completed their treatment. Um, so I see them uh, usually for several years after completion of therapy for all types of cancer. You know, we treat uh, obviously skin cancers, but we treat a lot of other uh, malignancies as well here. So that's my uh, role in the health system. Um, and thank you for talking about this. I mean, before we started, I said, you know, there's been so many personal stories in planning this conversation that have been sure. shared. Um, and you hear everyone, you know, bring up maybe a story of their family or their friend or something that maybe worried them. I mean, just to right. start, you know, could you just say, you know, what is skin cancer? I know there's different types and, you know, sort of sure. maybe the umbrella. So, uh, yep, skin cancer is, you know, the most common malignancy in the U.S., and um, there are multiple types of skin cancer, and it is essentially a damaged cell somewhere in, um, you know, in the thickness of the skin that has become uh, malignant due to damage typically from UV radiation. And uh, the three primary types are basal cells, squamous cell, and melanoma. Uh, there are some other, you know, more obscure types of skin cancer, but those are the three big ones that we see. And, um, you know, the melanomas tend to be the most concerning. Uh, they're, they act most aggressively. They have a higher propensity to spread to lymph nodes and um, even distant organs in the body. So those are the three big types. Um, overall, we divide them into non-melanoma cancers and melanoma cancers. Melanomas are tracked uh, in the cancer registry and are actually the fifth most common cancer uh, in the U.S. for the, the for 2022. And I think some people think to look for, you know, maybe an interesting freckle or something of a right. spot, but, you know, are there are there other um, sort of things that you need to look for? Because I've also heard of, you know, having something that might look like a pimple that doesn't go away and those sorts of right. things. Right. The general rule of thumb is anything new on your skin or anything that is changing. So it looked a certain way for years and now it's beginning to evolve and look different. Um, a lot of people think of the ABCDs, which is a good rule of thumb, uh, you know, lesions that are asymmetric. So if you divided them in half, uh, one half looks different than the other. Uh, lesions that have irregular borders, you know, sharp or angulated borders uh, are concerning. Um, variations in color within a mole or a lesion, uh, you know, where some parts are brown and some parts are pink or fleshy colored uh, is a concern. And um, of course, uh, diameter, so something that's growing and becoming larger. And uh, generally we, we talk about it, the diameter bigger than a pencil eraser. Uh, but the big one, the E, is anything evolving. So if you have something that has looked a certain way for years and, you know, it's changing, it's crusting, it's, like you said, beginning to look like a pimple or it uh, becomes more of a sore that won't heal, all of those things should be checked. And, you know, what are, is the best way to check yourself for that? Is it just going to, you know, other doctors? I've heard, you know, even going to the dentist is so important just to see if you have anything growing on your lips or your mouth. I mean, how important are all these doctors' visits? Sure. Well, you know, often the best place to start with a new skin lesion is the primary care provider. You know, there are some benign lesions that can look pretty scary, and the primary care provider can immediately look at them and say, that one's okay. Um, from there, if the primary care provider uh, believes it's concerning or is unsure, some of them will do biopsies, but uh, many times they'll refer you to a dermatologist to do a full evaluation. And how important are those skin checks every year? I think, you know, some people make that a priority, um, you know, whether it's in your hair or whether it's finding something on your foot, but how important is that yearly check? Uh, it's very important, um, particularly for patients who are at higher risk for skin cancer. So, you know, our patients with very fair skin that um, almost always burns and doesn't tan well, that skin type, uh, they have a higher propensity to develop skin cancers, uh, particularly as they age. Uh, people who have a lot of uh, UV damage to their skin should be checked definitely on a yearly basis. Certainly anyone with a history of prior skin cancers, and that's a big one. You know, we see patients who have had 
several skin cancers, but yet they're not going for those skin checks on a routine basis, and they really should be, uh, because if you've had one skin cancer, you're at risk for more in the future. So, and then, you know, some, some we don't think of, uh, patients who are chronically immunosuppressed, uh, whether they've had an organ transplantation or, um, you know, they're on chronic immunosuppression for an autoimmune disease, have a higher propensity to develop skin cancers. So, you know, it is important, uh, particularly if you know you are at high risk to get checked on a yearly basis. And what are those things that, that might put you at higher risk? Um, so you just said, you know, maybe prior skin cancer, but then, right. you know, are there family, are there genetic things involved? There are. Uh, so a family history does make you more prone. And that may be because, you know, if, if you have a family history of skin cancer, you know, your mom and dad maybe were fair skinned and burned as well. Or maybe it's that, you know, you're a more active family, so you have more sun exposure. But for whatever reason, a history of skin cancer in your family does increase your risk. And then there are some genetic syndromes that, um, that, uh, put people at much higher risk for skin cancers. And uh, those are a little bit more unusual, but you know, if, if there's a strong family history uh, and a patient has had multiple skin cancers, referral to a geneticist is sometimes recommended also. And, um, you know, I'll give myself as an example, but, you know, spending yeah. so much time outside, whether it was sports when you're younger, whether it's right. going to camp, you know, going outside to play. I mean, how much does that have an impact? So your cumulative lifetime UV exposure is one of the main risk factors for skin cancer. Um, you know, we talked about fair skin, but that UV exposure really is uh, one of the biggest links with your likelihood of developing uh, skin cancer. So for instance, patients who are in occupations where they have a lot of UV exposure are at much higher risk. Um, patients who live uh, near the equator. So the closer you are to the equator, you know, if you have fair skin and you, you live at those latitudes, you're going to be at higher risk. So that cumulative exposure is um, certainly a big risk factor for skin cancer. Right. And, and that I was going to bring that up with, you know, lifeguards right now, whether it's the pool on right. the beach, you know, people that do have work outside. Right. Um, I mean, are there ways to mitigate that, whether it's, you know, certain I've heard of UV shirts and I've heard of, you know, certain right. sunscreens. But what are some ways if you do have to be outside, especially this summer to, you know, help protect your skin? So uh, UV protective clothing is an excellent way to protect your skin. You know, of course, you have to be cognizant of the areas that aren't covered. So just because you have a long sleeve UV protective shirt on, you still need to use sunscreen on your face and hands. Um, but that is an excellent way to protect yourself, particularly if you have an occupation that requires you to be outside for long hours during the day. Um, sunscreen is a good way to protect yourself. And uh, we recommend SPF 30 or greater. Uh, an SPF 15 sunscreen will block about 93% of the damaging UV rays. And uh, if you go up to a 30, you get up to 97%. A 50 gets you to 98% blockage. So sunscreen is an excellent way uh, to protect yourself as long as it's being applied correctly. And, um, you know, those are the two big ones. Obviously, seeking shade, trying to avoid the uh, worst hours of the day between 10 and 4. Um, all of those things are helpful. And I've heard people say, you know, they put sunscreen on, whether it was, um, you know, spray in the morning before they go in the water or, you know, before they went outside. But then the reapplication is so important, right? It is. It is. The initial application, uh, you know, in most studies that they've, uh, you know, where they've looked at application of sunscreen, most people just don't use enough. Uh, the general rule of thumb is that you should be using a shot glass full of sunscreen uh, to cover the body. So that's the number one, is that the initial application, you really do need to, to use enough. Um, but on the reapplication side, every two hours is the general recommendation, unless, you know, if you've been in the water and you've been really sweating when you come out or when you dry off, you need to reapply them as well. 
And, you know, we, we said, you know, higher SPF, but in terms of nowadays, I feel like there's such a variety on the shelves. There's mineral, right. there's zinc, there's, um, you know, just regular, maybe athletic SPF that's supposed to be more resistant to sweat. I mean, is are there certain kinds that you need to look for or is that branding? Sure. I, well, you know, in, in healthcare, we often say the best kind of sunscreen is the one you'll wear. Sure. Um, so, but there are differences. Um, there are two main types of sunscreen. Uh, you mentioned mineral. Uh, so the two main minerals are zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, and they work by uh, basically creating a barrier on your skin and reflecting the UV radiation. Uh, the chemical sunscreens are usually a combination of chemicals that absorb the uh, UVA and UVB rays. And, uh, you know, a key point on those is that those really do need to be applied about 15 to 30 minutes prior to exposure for them to be effective. So, you know, you can't just put those on and then walk, you know, right out onto the beach. You need to give that a little bit of time to set, so to speak. Um, you know, then, the, you know, the big issue of sprays versus lotions uh, is something that people debate as well. And again, I think the best sunscreen is one that you'll wear. Um, sprays are super convenient. Uh, they do tend to not have as, as the application is an issue. Uh, the coverage is usually not as good um, as if you're using a lotion. And part of that, again, is the amount. You know, it takes a lot of the spray to really provide adequate coverage. And most people are just doing a quick pass over each arm and each leg. Um, and, you know, if you're out on a windy beach and you're using the spray, you know, a lot of it's heading down the beach. It's not actually contacting your skin. And, and that's a problem with the sprays as well. Um, so a, a lot of dermatologists will recommend, you know, a lotion base, you know, get really good coverage. And then if you like the convenience of the spray, take that out onto the beach or the pool or wherever you're going and use that for touch ups. So. And I mean, how important is it? We've talked about your body now, but like your eyes, your lips, some of mm -hmm. those things that maybe the average person doesn't think of doing that, you know, of covering that, except for maybe sure. the glare, maybe the glare bugs them. But, you know, how protective is that? The, well, the glare is definitely an issue. You know, sand, water, snow all really reflect uh, UV radiation. And so you're going to you're going to have more intense exposure in those conditions. Um, the eye protection is is very important. Um, you know, you certainly can get skin cancers of the eyelid and around the eye, which are much more difficult to deal with, but also just damage to the eyes themselves, to, you know, corneal damage, et cetera. So from that uh, radiation exposure. So wearing eye protection is really important and the lips as well. And again, if you get a skin cancer close to or on the lip, more difficult to deal with from a cosmetic perspective than, um, you know, if it's something on the arm or the back. Right. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I wanted to ask too was, you know, we've talked about maybe ways where um, you can protect yourself from future, you know, skin um, damage and exposure, but, you know, are there ways to help reverse effects or is it sort of, you know, you have them now, you just need to be even more careful maybe going forward? Right. Not really any way to reverse what has already happened, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's we probably get a twenty somewhere between twenty five and fifty percent of our lifetime UV exposure under the age of twenty. Um, so you know, as a parent, being cognizant of you know trying to encourage your kids to be diligent about uh, protecting themselves from the sun is important. Uh, but the damage that's already occurred can't be reversed. Uh, but it is important to protect yourself because again, it's that cumulative exposure. So it's not only what happened as a child or an adolescent, it's it's the exposure going forward as well. So very important to continue to protect yourself, um, even if you've already had a lot of exposure as a child. And I think for the average person um, that puts on makeup, you know, there are makeup brands right now that do have sunscreen in them, but and, mm -hmm. and mine, like let's for example, is 40, but how important is right. adding that extra layer of sunscreen in, you know, underneath that? Um, so it does help because that day-to-day -day, um, use helps mm -hmm. to limit, you know, the exposure that you get just from being outside even for short periods of time. 
So it is helpful, um, certainly. I think, you know, most people obviously think about putting sunscreen on just if they're going to the beach or going to the pool or they know they're going to be outside. But the um, day to day exposure does add up. And particularly if you have a job that takes you outside a lot or, um, you know, where you have a lot of sun exposure, it, it is very helpful. And, you know, I wanted, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, if you see something doing a skin check, but, you know, for people that, that maybe have seen something um, and, you know, maybe don't think it's anything or maybe people that have actually been diagnosed with skin cancer. I mean, can we talk a little bit about from the patient side, you know, are sure. there things that they need to expect or certain treatments that usually, um, you know, if it is a freckle that um, sort of are done to to take out that spot from your body? Uh, so, well, most skin cancer is treated surgically, so it's removed. Um, I do still encourage patients, even if it's something that they look at and they think, well, this doesn't really look bad to them. You know, a lot of people have in their mind this picture of a melanoma that's, you know, irregular and dark and, you know, just ugly looking to them. And then so if they see something that's new but doesn't necessarily look like that, that's kind of a false reassurance. If it's new, um, even if you don't think it's anything, you should have someone look at it. Uh, basal cells usually look like a tiny little red bump to start with. You know, it can have like a shiny or pearly surface. So most, you know, the most skin cancers are basal cells and squamous cells, and they're not going to look like those classic pictures um, that we see, you know, online of, of a mole that has uh, turned into melanoma. So it is important to get it checked. Um, as to the treatment, uh, usually, once a biopsy has confirmed the diagnosis, those are treated surgically, and there are a couple of ways to do that. If it is in an area that is difficult to treat surgically or there's a concern about wound healing, sometimes we will do radiation um, to treat skin cancers as well. And sometimes we'll do radiation as an adjunct to surgery for a skin cancer that has uh, not been removed until it was more advanced. And, um, you know, with that, I think a big question that I, that at least I have, um, that I've, you know, know that people ask is skin cancer, even though it, it does, it's about your skin, it, it can't operate like any other cancer that it, it unfortunately can spread and, and it can become worse. So when, when we say get it checked out early, I mean, just like any other cancer, right, you know, it could lead to cancer in other areas of the body. That is very highly dependent on the type of skin okay. cancer. So a basal cell skin cancer, those rarely spread. Okay. Uh, they do need to be taken care of just because the longer you let it go and they have to remove more skin, the cosmetic outcome and the repair is not going to be as optimal. Um, you know, if you take care of it early, that's going to be uh, a better outcome cosmetically. Um, squamous cells... Uh, those can be more aggressive sometimes. And, um, you know, there are particular types of squamous cell that are more aggressive and they can spread along the nerves. Uh, sometimes they can spread to lymph nodes. So those are, you know, certainly important to take care of in a timely fashion. And then melanoma is the one that has, a, you know, a much higher propensity to um, get into the lymphatic system uh, or the blood and spread to lymph nodes or even distant in the body. So, you know, that's the one that everyone is, uh, you know, the goal is to prevent that one, definitely. And catch it early because melanomas that are caught early have, you know, a 99% five-year survival if they're caught early. Um, so the key is to address it early. And, um, you know, the last thing I wanted to, to mention is, you know, we've talked about reducing your risk of going, you know, outside particularly in like a higher, um, you know, time of UV index or sun. Sure. But, you know, I've I've heard of that window where you're, you're supposed to really try to avoid the sun if possible. I, I believe it's around midday. Um, you know, right. so if you can, is it, you know, staying indoors, maybe going outside for exercise, you know, earlier in the morning or later at night? Sure. The time of the day, you know, plays a, a huge role in the um, the amount of UV radiation you're going to be exposed to. Um, the intense part of the day, uh, as you said, you know, right around midday, really uh, 10 to 2 is the most intense, you know, 
a lot of times in the summer, they'll say 10 to 4, uh, especially on a high UV index day. And, uh, you know, that UV index is, is calculated using a variety of um, factors, you know, from anything from cloud cover. Uh, it's taking into account the angle of the sun. And what it's really measuring is the intensity of the UV radiation at the surface that we're exposed to. So looking at the UV index, you know, if it's a really high UV index day, uh, maybe trying to do your activities early in the morning or later in the evening is, is uh, a smart thing to do. Well, Dr. Stefan, thank you so much. Um, you know, is there is there anything else that, you know, I'm, I'm sure that we could talk about, um, you know, much more regarding, you know, individual, um, you know, cases and so forth, but, but sure. just for general education purposes, you know, is there anything else that you would just like people to know, you know, going into this summer? Um, you know, just that there are a lot of factors with skin cancer that we can't really control. You know, you can't control your skin tone. Um, but the one thing that you can control is that exposure. So just to be cognizant of it um, and to be aware that, um, and, and, you know, most people are at this point that um, it's not just skin cancer, also skin aging is, is highly related to, to UV exposure as well. 